Oh, that's right, Joe Fernet is up there. Yeah. What's going on here? More. Rules of procedure. I just sent that like 30 seconds ago. Dun dun dun. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just sitting there when you got there. This is rules and procedures. Is this different than the memo we got in our email? Yes. All of this is new information. This is all that, all the materials we have. Oh, new information. Okay. So for the Planning Commission members on the line and the, and the Planning Commission members here, we have uh, some additional documents that we just received today. Um, so we, we emailed them to the Planning Commissioners and the ones and the Planning Commission members that are here, you have received them on your dais already. Um, so for those uh, Planning Commission members at home, you can check your email and there's um, a rules of procedure, a comment letter from the applicant on uh, the Bucko rezone, and a uh, comment letter from a local developer on the Bucko rezone. Okay, so I'm going to call the uh, meeting to attendance. It's uh, six. 34 on uh, Tuesday, 11-16. Uh, Can we uh, stand for the, uh, or sit for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So roll call. We have uh, Commissioners Freiberger, Batizzi, Johnson, Penno, Mannix and uh, Commissioner Frenette present. Is that correct, everybody? Okay. So we have uh, Commissioner uh, Huggins who is absent. So uh, has everybody had the uh, opportunity to uh, look at the uh, meeting minutes from the uh, prior meeting? I would like comments. I had a couple of comments. Go ahead. So the meeting adjournment time was is shown here as 8.24 p.m., but it was stated in the recording to be 9.14 p.m. It, it, was, it was only a late meeting, so... Uh... And I am looking for the other one. Danielle, just give me a minute to uh, pull it up. So if we have a, uh, a dispute on when it began or ended, I'm not too sure, John, what the uh, protocol for that is. Uh, this is Nikki. I would move to amend uh, the minutes to reflect the correct time. Okay. Thanks, Nikki. I'm glad to hear, by the way. Uh, so if somebody wants to make that uh, recommendation, uh, I'm open to it. I, I did have one other more of a question on clarification. So I don't know if that's appropriate to point out now oh. or. 
Go ahead. Okay, so under the second re zone request, Bucko, uh, paragraph two, the second sentence, she disagreed with the staff analysis of how the change from R15 zone as in the mixed commercial. I'm not sure what that's trying to say there. Danielle, what page are you on? On the uh, second page? Because there the, the was, yeah, yeah you know. Okay. Uh, we're going to revisit it again tonight anyway, so. It's page three. Or? It's under section page. two. I don't know. It's There's not really a page. Section two, yeah. page two. Well, there's not section really two. pages, but okay. Okay, so we have page two. So do we have a disagreement what was said or? It's just syntax. Okay, it's a, no so it's a syntactical thing, so we can correct that. And Danielle, thank you, by the way, you know, details matter. I think it just it. should read, uh, she disagreed with the staff analysis of how the change from R15 zone to mixed commercial. Okay. okay. It wasn't trying to say anything besides, you know, she okay. disagreed. Yeah. With the analysis. So we have some updates clearly to the to the meeting minutes. And so, uh, and does does yours at the top say September nineteenth? Yes. It does. It'd be yeah. October. So I would recommend just not taking action on the minutes and asking for um, those clerical updates, and then you can approve the minutes at the next meeting. Thank you, Nikki. So can somebody just say what Nikki just said <laughs> before, before we move forward uh, into any of this? I would recommend not taking action on the October 19, 2021 minutes tonight, but... Uh, okay at the next meeting. Okay, so I, I guess is that a motion? And does somebody want to uh, second that motion? Uh, point of clarification, would that be just a motion to table till the next meeting? I guess so. Okay, <laughs> I second the motion, motion to table. To, it's a motion to table, yeah, yeah. I've never seen that before, but anyway, I'm good with it. For clarification, it's actually a motion to postpone to a date certain. Table means okay. to take it off the table. Okay. So what would your recommended language be since this is all going to be on the uh, public record? My recommendation would be a motion to postpone um, approval of the minutes until the next meeting, which the date I don't have right in front of me. Okay. So can somebody please make a motion and uh, we'll so move So moved. Okay, so moved. There you go. Okay, it's seconded. So we will now move on to the, uh, the public hearing portion of our business. And uh, is there anyone uh, in the audience uh, present or online that has uh, anything on the uh, general public comments side. Oh, I, I apologize. I, I open up the general public comment side at 641. And uh, do I have anyone in the audience that would like to say anything? Okay. General public comments is now closed at 641. 42. So, Joe, to clarify, uh, the oh, general public yeah. comment period is for things that are not on the agenda. So if you're here to speak to anything that is on the public hearing, that's scheduled for the public hearing, such as the Bucko Rezone or the Ruby yeah, Rezone. No, no, no. John, again, I'm, I'm just reading off the agenda right here. So I'm just going off, and, and you're right, the, 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 the regular, I just went off the general public comments, opened, 
closed. And uh, would you like to uh, introduce the uh, public hearing yes. portion of it as we move forward? So, have at it. Right. Okay. So, we're uh, before we quite jump into the public hearing part of this. Um, uh, want to acknowledge that there was a little. Uh, the, the procedures at the last meeting didn't go as uh, we typically yeah. hoped. So to provide it to the Planning Commission uh, today is uh, a draft rules of procedure for the Cedar Valley Planning Commission meeting. And, and so what this includes is information about uh, how the meeting is, how a Planning Commission meeting is to be run. So um, we put this together uh, to address such things as Planning Commission attendance um, and uh, how the agenda is prepared, the general public comment period, uh, how the meeting is run, and public hearing procedures specifically. So we wanted to bring this document for the Planning Commission to review today, and uh, we, we would like to take action on this at the next Planning Commission meeting, if that's what I understood uh, our city attorney to want us to do. But, uh, you know, before we get into the public hearing part, I, and since we haven't had a chance to fully go over these uh, rules of procedure, I wanted to lay out what the, the general pub what the, uh, public hearing procedures are so we're able to uh, go forward with the public hearings a little smoother to this time. So I'll just read this off for the benefit of those that don't have it right in front of them. For the public hearing procedures part of this document, it says the chairperson shall open the public hearing on the subject case by identifying the proposal. The chairperson shall state that the testimony and input will be taken in a prescribed fashion. All persons wishing to speak on the matter before the planning commission must first be recognized by the chairperson uh, for the record, that person will state his or her name and address and uh, as well as any group or organization he or she represents, if any. All statements by the speaker shall be addressed to the planning commission. The chairperson may limit the amount of time allowed any person or group in order to give all who wish the opportunity time to speak. The chairperson may limit input to avoid duplication. Because public hearings are to gather information, there will be no cross-examination of speakers. The presentation order shall be as follows. Staff planner. Presentation of, uh, of staff report and any other materials or correspondences into the record. And then followed by the proponent. Uh, the proponent's presentation and statements uh, by representatives of the uh, proponent or applicant. And then the chair will open the public hearing. And following that, then members of the public are allowed to speak. Presentations and statements by the public who wish to speak for or against the proposal or application. The hearing is to gather information. Questions from the public are not answered at the public hearing. Questions about the proposal or application shall be addressed to staff during regular city hall business hours or in writing to the planning and building department. The public testimony portion of the public hearing is then closed. Planning commissioners then deliberate on the proposal or application and testimony received. Members may ask questions of both staff and any other speakers to clarify their understanding of relevant points or to gather additional information. All questions shall be posed through the chairperson who shall ask the appropriate party for answers. The motion, a motion for disposition may then be made. The motion may be to continue the hearing, to gather more information, to recommend approval, approval with conditions, denial of the proposal or application or forward to the city council with no recommendation. The planning commission action shall be uh, transmitted to the city council in writing shall include the recommendation, findings of fact, the planning staff report, other correspondences, if any, and a summary of testimony presented to the planning commission. So that is the, that's the process we're going to follow for this public hearing. And we can have more discussion about <coughs> these rules and procedures at the next planning commission meeting. But those are pretty standard. There's nothing really to debate about those. So I just wanted to put those uh, procedures out there for everybody to understand how we're going to operate today. So with that, uh, I think we're ready for the, the chair to do his 
duty at this point. I get it. It's my show. No worries. So we're going to open up the public hearing meeting of CPA-1-21-2021, comprehensive plan amendments, including two okay. rezone requests. And we're going to start with rezone request number 2020-012, Ruby request to change the designation of roughly three acres of land from mixed commercial use to residential five. Meeting's open, 6.58, 6.48. Okay, so uh, thank you. Point of, point of order, we aren't, we aren't actually going to open the public hearing on each individual matter until after the staff presentation. Then you open the public hearing. That, 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 that's fine. John, it's your show. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, this is uh, not the first time the Planning Commission has heard ha had a public hearing on this issue. Um, we have had several, uh, this is a holdover from 2020, as I described at the last Planning Commission meeting. And the City Council asked the Planning Commission to re-review it and uh, make, uh, make a stronger documentation of the process and uh, provide a, a recommendation to the City Council to, to uh, consider in 2021. Uh, the last Council at the last Planning Commission hearing we heard from several members of the public. Uh, the did include that tra uh, the information of the uh, that those persons presented in the staff report, although very uh, briefly. Um, there, it is read into the, the public record and it is available uh, in the meeting minutes and in uh, audio form on our website. Uh, so this project is a request to change three acres of mixed commercial land to uh, residential five. Uh, the, the surrounding properties are also residential five. The three acre area is the roughly the driving range and office part of and parking lot part of the, the golf course off of North Fruitdale Road. It includes the three acres up uh, from Portobello Road south to the, uh, the, the gas line and uh, east of the creek to North Fruitdale Road. And that is the three acre area as shown on the map in a couple of places on the memo. Um, I think I, staff's presented on this enough times that I'm concerned about rehashing a, lo a lot of the information. Um, I'll just uh, go over our staff conclusions is that uh, the surrounding land uses are characterized as residential and a regional county park to the east. Um, the, there's a tributary to the Brickyard Creek that borders it on the west uh, and has, requires a 110 foot buffer from the ordinary high water mark. So that takes up a fair amount of part of this property, but it may be mitigated down to 55 feet uh, through um, restoration plantings as part of a development. Uh, to an extent, the commercial uses are um, incompatible with residential zoning. However, the scale of any commercial use on a three acre parcel would likely have limited impact on the surrounding residential uses. Uh, <clears throat> the long and short of this is, uh, you know, this, this is mixed commercial land. Uh, it would be fairly limited commercial in scale based on the, the surrounding area and what would be necessary there. So you're not gonna get a Walmart on something like this. It would be something more like a local convenience store or possibly a gas station. However, gas station seems very unlikely in this area. It's, a it's fairly limited by the critical areas nearby and we've received a lot of testimony about just the, the golf course in general receiving a lot of rain, which of course on uh, a week where we've received over six inches of rain in a few days, that's fresh on everybody's mind. Um, the question is, do we rezone, what is the best use for this three acres? So um, staff finds that 
the, you know, our comp plan has designated this as commercial land uh, for a purpose. It was thought out in, when it was put as commercial land and um, staff is not, uh, not, does not recommend lightly to change mixed commercial land to residential land. Uh, we have in our comprehensive plan a balance of required amount of residential land to accommodate our projected 20-year population growth. We see that our population growth is not exceeding uh, by any significance our 20-year our uh, land capacity for residential lands. And further, when we consider where do we put commercial land if we remove commercial land, that is very difficult. This process is not proposing to put any additional commercial land someplace else. Uh, it would just be strictly losing commercial land. So staff has not recommended that this rezone be approved for the reasons stated. And that uh, there's some procedural, you know, uh, information in here, like how many hearings we've had and the timelines uh, throughout this document. But uh, we have not received any additional information as part of the public hearing process, uh, the public notification process, I apologize. Uh, last uh, week and a half ago, we posted notice on the website. We posted notice on the site uh, in two different places of this public hearing, and we put it in the newspaper uh, and mailed to every, all the property owners and residents within 500 feet to make them aware of this action and this hearing. We've heard this several, we've heard this issue several times now, so staff is encouraging that we, if the Planning Commission is prepared and has enough information, uh, make, a recommend, make their recommendation to the Council after today's hearing. So with that, uh, staff is done with our presentation. So per the rules and procedure, uh, you may now open the, uh, you, know, you, uh, you may now ask the proponent to give a presentation if they would like. John, thank you. I, it, you guys put so much work into uh, so many different things and it's absolutely appreciated. So we're gonna open up the meeting right now to the uh, proponent as well as after the proponent is concluded, we'll uh, open it up to the uh, general public. Nikki, do you concur with that? Yes, it's the proponent's turn to um, explain the reason for the application. And then after the proponent speaks, you open it up for public hearing. Thank you. Mr. Ruby, are you there? How about it? Thank you. Can I be heard? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You have the, you have the floor. <laughs> I'll speak loudly. <clears throat> Please do that. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Bob Ruby, uh, 801 Metcalf Street, uh, Cedar Woolley. I'm a member of Granite Holdings, which is in title and owns the property there. Uh, this has been before you several times before. There, there's been a lot of lively discussion on it. Mr. Coleman, going back to the beginning, uh, made a great staff report on it, findings of, of fact. I'm, I, I, I know that's included in the information I have. Uh, together with all of his uh, explanations. As the third time, there are, there have been a, a, at least several and perhaps a number of, of issues, not the least of which is uh, purpose and use of the property that's, that's been discussed on the, the various trips, pros and cons of that. Um, separate from this request, there is a development application on the, the parcels, the, the property surrounding this, south of Portobello, basically west of 
Fruitdale Road. It's in the city. That is zoned R5. So on all but the surrounding area, including that property to the north, is zoned residential and has residential in it. To the east, of course, is um, the northern state property. The application has been accepted. It, it's for residential development. Uh, it, that is in process. What I, I'd like to encourage the commission to look at and focus here on is the criteria related to and make their decision based on the specific part of the rezone, including that criteria. <clears throat> so this application is not about development. It, it, it's a straight up request for a rezone on three, approximately three acres of property out there. Um, <clears throat> that being said, it, it's not about development or not development. Uh, the, what, what rights accrue on either case are, w w would be there. Other things that will not change directly as a result of this are issues on critical areas, flooding, environmental, civil engineering, buffers, and things like that. Under each scenario, were it to remain commercial or whether it is changed to residential, those criteria will have to be gone through, met, and overcome anyway. So no change there. The intention is to develop the, the property. I am a private, for-profit developer, and I need to make a living. Um, I make no apologies about that. Um, I encourage you, I implore you as a group to look at this from the, the direct standpoint <clears throat> for consideration in making the change. And that is really, should the zoning be changed from what it is now to what is being requested in the same way that the, I would encourage the group to look at any other change? And secondly, is there any disadvantage? I'm asking, I'm, I'm requesting that you find no disadvantage, that being the case, in, in a straight up rezone. Um, in as much as it does match the surrounding area, the vicinity, and um, that is R5, and that was what the request would be. So uh, that concludes my remarks. If, if there's any questions from the commission, I'd be happy to answer those, respond. Does anyone have any uh, questions for uh, Mr. Ruby? Again, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm on a screen here. Commissioner Frenette, Freiberger, anyone? Just a point of order, Joe. I think that um, we're supposed to save our questions till after we hear from the public for every, the way that I'm reading this procedure. Okay. Nick and Nikki's here, so she would be the one that. So I'm not bothered by that one either way. Um, Either way, you're going to be asking the questions. Um, but the way that we have the rules drafted, it does say wait until after um, okay. public has not had an opportunity to comment. That, that, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Ruby. So it's going to now, we're going to open up the meeting to the uh, general public. And I'm not too sure mm -hmm. who's in the audience or who's online. So, Bill, you're, you're, you're going to need to be in control of this if we have... Uh, participants online. And if we do have participants online, just please introduce yourself, uh, your name, address, and uh, that, that that's pretty much it. Okay. Joe, this is Bill Chambers. Just, just so you know, uh, each individual participant can unmute themselves and okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me?
in here. Well, you're, you're going to need to be the monitor here because, like I said, I everything from where I'm sitting right now, it's like I, I can't tell. Can you hear so, us? There, Hello? Barely. I, I can hear a person, yes. Hi. Yes, hello. This is Rick Judd at 1310 Fruitdale Road, just above the golf course. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I believe okay, we can. very good. I've, I've listened to Mr. Ruby's speech, and uh, we've heard it in 30 years, several times before, um, of changing the use of this thing from a golf course previously that was a cow pasture and a holding area for thousands of gallons of water. Um, the area just last week, I hope somebody had a chance to take a drive, just, excuse me, this week, uh, to take a drive by and see how much water actually gets on there in a, in a rain event, of which we will probably have many more, just like it. Um, and if it's possible to possibly channel it off, but where do you put it? Water doesn't run uphill. Uh, there's going to be huge amounts of houses on up the hill with the final phases of the the development that's over the hill and stuff. More water coming down off of that into that same area. Uh, and the only place it can go is into to the Brickyard Creek and on down the road. So where and when all that water starts down there, there's gonna be some real problems. And that's why I'm not for um, more housing. We're gonna have plenty of housing around here. You can see them going up like crazy. So let's just try and keep it like a golf course, Mr. Ruby, please. Um, and that's basically all I have to say. Thank you. And this is Jim Stevens. Do I get to go next? Absolutely. Okay. So um, I would, you know, concur with the statements. Um, I guess one question that I had was this is a rezone. It, it looks like a change from mixed commercial to just resident, residential now. Correct. Because the last one was talking about mixed commercial. And now it's changing, they want to change it to um, residential, I guess they call it five. So that would be all houses, right? I, I, Mr. Stevens, I, I believe the uh, proposal is to uh, change it from mixed commercial, which still has a residential component, by the way to uh i believe in r7 it's our it's an r5 five, residential yeah. five units per acre and so it's five so you would have yeah, five, five. Only units per acre and, and that that's what the proposal is okay so because see before i think it said uh, uh mixed commercial and now they're changed they want to change it to r5 or residential where it's just going to be houses not anything else Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. And then my wife is here and she would like to comment. So we can't, we cannot hear you in, um, we in, live above the golf oh. course on Fruitdale, and I'm concerned about how this will affect our neighborhood. I'm sympathetic to Mr. Judge's comment, and if it were up to me, I'd make it into a neighborhood park. So uh, I'm concerned about how this will affect our neighborhood. It will also be an input to children in the we're, we're still having a hard time hearing you. If you could speak directly into your, your microphone, okay. that would be helpful. Basically, basically what she's saying is, is that um, she, she'd rather, you know, I think every, everybody would like to see it developed some other way, like a city park or something like that, which I don't think because, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. But I think that the concern is that, as the Mr. Jed concern and many of the other people speaking the last time uh, talked about the same thing you know and and it's not, not just because of the water event that we've had this week we're talking about all of the time this happens every year is that how are you going to mitigate all of that 
water on the golf course, you know, and, and, you know, sure it dries up in the summer, but boy, every, every winter we have the same thing happen. You know, you look at the, the houses across the way, um, off, off of highway 20, where you've got, they've got it closed now. And those buildings are underwater. How are you going to prevent from that from happening, happening on the golf course? I don't see how you're going to mitigate that. Mr. Stevens, this is not about the golf course. Okay, Joe, this is simply Joe. a rezone. Go, go ahead, John. I'm, I'm, so, I, I, our, people are getting confused, I think, of two different things. This is not about so, the golf course. Okay, it, it's okay. It's okay to 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 let them speak. Uh, speak. Just a That's point right. of order, though, for the commissioner or um, for the chairman. I, I do believe that we have the ability to limit public comment to the matter at hand, which is uh, separate from. Uh, yeah. The issue of water mitigation. Uh, we've heard okay. countless public comments about water mitigation, which is I irrelevant uh, to the yes, question no. facing the council no, or the planning commission currently. Um, we are debating whether the property should be zoned mixed commercial or residential five. And um, I would just comment to the to the public that uh, mixed commercial allows buildings five stories tall. It could be a gas station. It could be, I mean, all, all sorts of different things. Um, as it's currently zoned, Mr. Ruby would be legally entitled to build uh, under the mixed commercial zoning guidelines there. Thank you, Commissioner Maddox. Thank you. So I would I'd like, like to move on to the next uh, individual that would like to uh, testify or I'd like to testify my hands up there, there you go uh, are you Terry I'm Paul Cock oh Paul I'm sorry I all I can see is things on a screen I can't see your name or anything so please introduce yourself name address phone okay. number, uh, the whole nine yards you got it <laughs> sure my name is Paul Cock my wife and I live at 975 Wedmore Place, which is about a block from the golf course. I, I was a little concerned that there was no public comment mentioned on this because I sent in a public comment with a ton of photos to Nikki this afternoon. Maybe I'm just, did you get them, Nikki? I have no idea myself. Yeah. So well, I want to make it, you know, it should be directed to, to staff so I can get it to the planning commission. Um, so okay. uh, as in the public notice, it, it, it's, it states to send to the planning department. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the, the three acre zone, I am opposed to it. Um, I, I kind of disagree with the respectfully disagree with the assertion that this has nothing to do with water mitigation because it kind of does. It's uh, if they're going to put residential there, then they'll put residential on the other part of the uh, golf course. It sounds like it's part of the plan, but you know I'll sort of limit my comments. Um, the in those pictures that I sent, and this is again why I think the water mitigation is an issue. There was an enormous pond which is right in the middle of where that three acres is. Um, I'm not entirely sure of that. I'd have to look at the diagram. Um, but, you know, for the past, it's just, uh, you know, Mr. Judd talked about how this previously was a cow pasture. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I am going to mention the flooding because we've lived here for over 20 years and you know may have rained six inches recently, but we, we see it flood every year. And the pictures I sent in show significant uh, ponds of water on the golf course. Across the street, the uh, wetlands turned into a lake. Um, so again, the issue is even if you develop further at the three acres, where does the water go? Um, I also had a question uh, prior efforts to develop the golf course over the years, as Mr. Judd said, uh, for over 30 years were, uh, were rejected um, as officials each time prudently, um, I think, had historic knowledge that the golf course floods. 
the last thing I wanted to mention was um, the issue of, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, oh, yeah. So another one of the photos I sent shows uh, standing water on Wedmore Place where we live, further development of the golf course and even the three acres. Um, both Wedmore and Calkin Streets are at a lower elevation than the golf course. Flooding the golf course ends up on Brickyard Creek. Um, as flooding increases because of the development, that'll flow down to Wedmore and Calkin Streets, negatively infecting our safety, quality of life, and property values. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. So again, I'm at a disadvantage here since I'm on screen staring at myself. Uh, is there anyone else, uh, Bill, that we know that is online right now that would like to testify? Or is there anyone else in the, uh, in the audience uh, in general? Yeah, uh, this is Tim Woodmancy. Tim. I'd like to say something real quick. Um, Tim Woodmancy, BYK Construction, um, 702 Metcalf Street. Um, I, th I think that a lot of the comments that are, are being made from the neighbors are more um, a civil engineer, you know, concern over a, a zoning concern. Um, you know, that's, that's more of a, a complaint that I would think would be heard at a uh, preliminary plat, um, you know, um, uh, hearing. Um, I, I'm in support of, of changing the zoning. I think the city needs more housing. Um, the mixed commercial as it sits, it, it appears to me that it was originally zoned mixed commercial to kind of, um, to um, coexist with what was there um, with the golf course. So I, I think that's why it was zoned mixed commercial in the first place. I think um, it's fully surrounded by residential and it's not a good place for a commercial development. If Mr. Ruby goes on and develops all the property around it, it'll just be a vacant piece of land sitting there no longer running as a golf course. Um, and so those are those are the reasons why I uh, I support uh, the reason. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience or online? <clears throat> I'm going to take that as a no. Are you? So, so we do have people in the audience here. We're uh, if there's not anybody else online, when we're done with the online people, then we can move on to the people in the audience. Yeah, John, you got you got to help us with that because we're not there. So if you could uh, monitor that. Uh, so if there if there's anybody else online that would like to speak on on this uh, the the rezone Ruby rezone online. Uh, let us know now, and if there's no more, then we'll move on to the people in the in the building. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I believe we can. This is Terry. Yeah, this is Terry, uh, 1310 North Fruitvale. I just want to say that I'm opposed to the zone change in that uh, three acres, and. Um, that's it. I just want you to know that I'm against it. And I won't talk, no. I won't talk about water because everybody's already done that. <laughs> it, it, it's important that people feel that they can participate in uh, the, the, the overall uh, plan of what, what happens, that, that you do have a say. So anyway, do we have anyone else online? Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So, so John, it's going to be up to you right now, in house. I, I don't believe we have anybody else. Yep. Online. Okay. Okay. So, uh, we'll bring up the first person from the audience today, in the building. Am I allowed to drop these to speak? Yeah, you know. What My you mouse or no. <laughs> okay. 
My name is Susie Williams. I live at 1058 Wedmore Place. I've lived there for 50 years. And I have to disagree with the water mitigation cannot be part of this rezoning because it's just, it's, it's a fact. I lived through the 75 flood, the 90 flood, the 2000, Zen and three flood. We've had water in our property without that golf course being developed. And I also have a question. Am I understand that Mr. Rudy Ruby wants to change this to mixed commercial or? It's currently mixed commercial and he's. Seven, he it's, wants to. Yes. It's currently mixed commercial and he wants to change it to it's residential five, five, which is roughly five units per acre. Okay. Um, I've submitted documents and documents and documents. And I would also like to add that Mr. Ruby is the third developer that we've been through this um, disagreement with on the development of that golf course. And I would also like to point out that uh, no other city council or planning commission has ever allowed it to happen because of what happens out there and the amount of water. And other than that, I have no, I sat on the planning commission myself. I have no objection to uh, land development and encourage land development, but I'm strictly against irresponsible developments without the regard to the damage that they can do to other people. The development up that we saw in the 2003 flood, and if anybody wants to go through mountains of videos and photographs over the years, and it's consistent, every 15 to 20 years, we have a major flood. And that golf course and that creek, they spew over. And with the development, I just watched them put in the development down the road, which is a very nice development across from Independence Lane. And I couldn't even count the amount of dump trucks that went by the house every day to build that land up so they could develop it. Now, nobody's gonna be telling me that engineering or however you're gonna do it, that land is gonna be built up at the golf course because it sits so low everywhere and it's a swamp and the gentleman was right it turned into a it turns into a lake every year we're not done this year had it i guarantee you and, and i have made plenty of photos of the last week uh had we reached the level that they expected for it to crest at 41 feet in mount vernon which thank god didn't happen we would have had water without a development on that property. And I really object to that the water mitigation and those issues are different from the rezoning because the whole purpose of the rezone is to develop the property. And my question has been the same for 50 years. What are you gonna to do to control that water if you allow a developer to come in and fill that land and put houses on it. After the Sock Mountain View development was put up on the hill, Independence Lane, for the first time ever in its history, flooded out. And it was flooded almost right up level to McCargyle Road. And there were houses there sitting underwater. That had never happened previous to Sock Mountain View estates being built. And it's the only, only lot of land <laughs> and acreage in Cedar Woolley that um, we've ever opposed because of that. In 90, where Janicki sits, he said that entire place was underwater. Three feet of water. I'm not just talking inches of water or a foot of water. Mr. Ruby, three days ago, had very deep water right in the area that he's talking about that three acres where the clubhouse and the barns ditch. And uh, I've just, I've submitted letters and documents and letters when he first put it in. Um, and I just wanted to 
But somewhere right there, and I don't, I don't know, I thought did, has he requested for a, a ma'am, ma'am, residential you know, survey? I appreciate everybody's My comments here. Yes. However, what we're talking about here is a rezone. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the golf course. We're not talking about the specifics of what's happening there as far as uh, you know, water and, and things like that. Mr. Ruby has simply presented that he wants to do a rezone from a mixed commercial, which, by the way, has a significant residential component to it, okay? And he just wants to bring it down to a single family. So we're, we're not talking about the golf course. Everybody's getting kind of a little bit off task, and I don't want to interrupt people, but I'd also like to move things along whereby we, we stay focused on, on, on what, the, what the objective is right now. And it's simply a rezone, okay? From a mixed commercial that, again, has a significant residential portion to it, okay? And they just want to bring it down to a single family or five. So if, if you can conclude or you have anything more to add, uh, go ahead. I don't want to be disrespectful, but I also want to keep everybody on task as well. I Thank understand. you. I understand that. But you can't eliminate the golf course because it's the clubhouse and the driving range that sits on that water that he wants rezoned. I would also add to other public opinion, and then I'll end, is that uh, that land, especially with all the development and apartments and uh, development going on around the city, which is great, but uh, I would recommend it, the best use of that property ever would be to turn it into a public park. And I would be willing to work my heart out to help earn the money <laughs> or write grants to get the money to purchase that land. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, John, do we have anybody else uh, in-house that would like to uh, have anything to say? No, there's, there's no other members of the public here. Okay. So, at this point, I'm going to close the, is that correct, uh, that I'm going to close the uh, public portion and open it up to uh, discussion for the uh, Planning Commission? Again, I, I can't see people, so feel free to jump on it. I have a, a question for staff. Um, do you know uh, if there is a different or what the uh, lot coverage sort of difference is between the mixed commercial zone and um, the R5 zone? Like uh, in my... Are, are, my you, are you referring to like... Uh, impervious surfaces? So um, lot coverage... In the mixed commercial zone is is not limited. So you know, besides uh, probably 25% landscaping or 15% landscaping, which would likely be you know impervious would I'm sorry be pervious areas, whereas the rest could be impervious. Um, in the R5 zone, there's not really a limit to the uh, pervious uh, uh, the impervious pavement amounts required. Uh, or allowed, but um, the building coverage is limited to 50% of, or I'm sorry, 35% of the lot, but that doesn't include driveways and and porches and gravel but, uh, parking from, areas. From my experience in residential development, uh, there are significant limitations on allowable per impervious surfaces on a lot, or is that not the case in the R5 zone? Um, not particular, not, not, there's no strict zoning uh, difference, uh, limits on, on the R5, no. Okay. Anyone else? Um, an issue of concern that I've had with this um, from the beginning that hasn't been satisfied is the fact that if we're going to lose this mixed commercial zoning, we have to make it up somewhere. And the entire time I've been on the Planning Commission, that has been less than a easy um, subject, not for Planning Commission, not for staff, and not for 
uh, community members. It's often a point of angst and division. And so, you know, I, there's no alternative that's been presented with losing that. I know that we don't have a ton of it, so there's not like a, there's a lot of wiggle room that we can, you know, give away without actually having to make it up somewhere else. And so that's a point of concern of mine that just really has not been addressed and, and kind, of, kind of withholds my, my support of this. Commissioner Frenette, I can, I can see you on the screen. Would you like to add anything to this, Joseph? Uh, no, but Eric brings up a real good point. And uh, I remember back many times that this uh, subject came up. And just like he said, we had to talk a lot about where are we going to make it up. And uh, not sure how to address that at this point. Anyone else? I'm also gonna agree with Eric on that. Um, we, we need the mixed commercial. I know I just, it, it, it's hard for me because it's like, what can they put up there as mixed commercial? But there's so much residential now, I could see, you know, you need some little services, even a little just handy mart or, you know, a sandwich shop. I'm sure you got enough houses up there already that the people there could use those. Um, yeah, I just, the, the mixed commercial part bothers me. You know, at the end of the day, though, our mixed commercial zone does allow for residential uses as well. So it's, it's not like, uh, I guess this was my point from the beginning. It's kind of like you're really not losing anything. But uh, it seems like the uh, public right now is just really concerned about water that really doesn't have anything to do with this particular rezone. However, you know, their voices are heard, and I, I, I do believe that's important. So at this particular point, right, so does somebody, it, it's up to the mayor and council to decide whether they rezone or not. All we are is an advisory group, and i kind of hearing, if I'm reading between the uh, tea leaves here, that we're not in favor of uh, a rezone to an R5 unless somebody, you know, speak up, okay, and leaving it up. in the zone that it's currently in. So uh, I'm going to throw that out on the table right now as to uh, would somebody like to make a recommendation as to what we believe it should or should not be and, and put it up to a vote before I move it up the uh, Joe, move it down I've got the a couple other questions, if you don't mind. No, absolutely. You, you, you absolutely. Have at it. Um, this is a question for staff. Uh, are we allowed to make a recommendation beyond the request that's currently either approving or denying the request that is currently on the table? Well, uh, so the applicants requested something specific. So, the, you know, the the request is, can it be R five? So sure. the so the motion should really be based around, um, does the planning commission recommend that it become R five? Or, you know, that that that's that's the request. And are we allowed to recommend? Uh, adopting that, but add stipulations? Like, can we, um, and I, you know, I don't know exactly what they would be at this point, but I, I'm just out of curiosity, what is our ability to sort of add caveats or stipulations to this? Well, there's not a whole lot of caveats or stipulations to uh, the R5 zone. So, um, I mean, if you were to say, you know, uh, can be R5 zone, but not allow certain uses or something like that, what you, that would be doing is creating a different type of zoning. So that, that wouldn't be something that you would be allowed. Sure. Okay. 
So uh, for the record, I um, still find myself in favor of this rezone request. Um, I believe that uh, I, I have no comment on whether the water issues can or cannot be addressed. Um, I do believe that the allocations of mixed commercial and residential that have happened under our comprehensive plan um, were done at a time before our current housing crisis. And I understand there may be some hesitation to uh, make rash decisions uh, in a time of crisis, but I do believe that uh, more varied uh, types and allowances for housing within the urban growth area is the most important way that we could be directing our zoning decisions. Um, Cedar Woolley has plenty of mixed commercial land currently. Uh, and we've heard testimony from multiple developers and various people that uh, the economics of developing the mixed commercial zone are very difficult to meet. And um, we have a duty to try to protect the farmland and to try to protect, you know, to keep population growth within the urban growth area. And I believe that, um, you know, staff has mentioned that we're right on track with sort of growth projections, but um, there's no housing availability right now. And so there's nowhere for growth to happen. And um, without uh, the creation of new and additional housing, um, we're gonna stay in the same crisis that we're in. And I think I, I would personally prefer to see it zoned uh, at a higher density than R5, um, but it seems like our, uh, it seems like it may be with outside of our scope to be able to recommend such a thing. But uh, for those reasons, I uh, would be in favor of this rezone. I think that um, not allowing new residential development uh, because of some calculation about mixed commercial land availability in, the, in Cedar Woolley uh, is misguided because uh, there's a lot more uh, mixed commercial land that's available here that's uh, underutilized or just plain old not utilized right now and uh, the current need for um, development is residential and uh, once again these comments uh, have no bearing on the water situation currently uh, Mr. Ruby could build a building 60 feet tall on this three acre mixed commercial zone uh, if given the right setbacks. And as John said, uh, the lot coverage allowances are much higher in the mixed commercial zone. So uh, the current rules that the city would be obligated to allow Mr. Ruby to develop under the current zoning allow much greater bulk and much greater lot coverage than the R5 zone. And so uh, by those metrics, the impact on the water situation uh, would be much greater uh, if developed under the current zoning regulations for this parcel. So uh, those are my comments and uh, that's it for now. Anyone else? So I guess, I guess we're at a point where, you know, we can all agree to disagree or whatever it is. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Did I hear someone? <laughs> Again, I'm at a total disadvantage here. I'm staring at a screen. Eric, was that you? Joe, go ahead. Um, just to clarify, I didn't hear um, Mr. Coleman speak up after Mr. Johnson mentioned the finding new mixed commercial zoning. Is that a true statement, John, that we would have to find it in order to do this? Or is that waived in this case? Well, there's no waiving it. it what it does is it, uh, if we 
uh, eliminate mixed commercial zone and we don't create new mixed commercial zoning someplace else, then we're just missing out on the opportunity to provide land for mixed commercial house, uh, mixed commercial uses in the future. Like, so, I mean, clearly right now, the, um, the need is, and the market is asking for residential development on land. But in 10 years, the, the case may be the complete opposite. Um, you know, the housing market can shift and uh, commercial could be the, uh, could be the, the flavor of the month. Um, and then we would be, uh, then people would be asking us for mixed commercial zoning. So our comprehensive plan is in place to, to look for 20 years of, of growth potential. So we, uh, we've done our projected population and employment growth, and we're looking at this in the long run. That's how the city often, that's how the city really needs to operate is what is the long-term needs, not what is necessarily the most pressing issue at the moment. Um, now, we always try to accommodate the most pressing issue of the moment. And, you know, I think I've demonstrated in our, uh, in, in the packet that we do have enough land to accommodate our 20 year population growth, even at our increased trend. So, you know, it, the, the, the cities, the city is in, uh, in the position for 20 years of planning, not what's necessarily the, the trend right now, which clearly is, you know, a need for housing. Um, but we don't know, you know, we follow the trends over long term and we study our past um, to see what, what needs are. And that's how we came up with this need for mixed commercial and residential. John, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so at the no next uh, comprehensive plan update cycle, um, all of these zones will be looked at again, correct? And the numbers recalculated, is that? Correct. In the next year and a half, two years, we'll be... Um, uh, working with the Skagit Council of Governments, you know, the, the other planning departments and the, the city, the county, um, all of the jurisdictions in the county and looking at what our new population projections will be between uh, 2025 and 2045. And in, uh, in 2025, we'll be, uh, June of 2025, we're, we'll be done with our land use capacity analysis and uh, balancing the amount of uh, zoning for our projected population growth, both residential and, and, uh, and job growth for the next planning horizon. So we're just a year and a half away from uh, redoing, or a year away really from starting the process of re-examining how much land we need to accommodate the next 20 year planning horizon between 2035 or 2025 and 2035. 2025 to 2045, excuse me. And at that time, um, the how does that work? Does uh, is it uh, areas in the UGA that are decided upon to be zoned uh, differently, or are zones changed to accommodate the percentages that are already there? Like, would it be possible for some of the commercial to be changed to mixed commercial? or would that be imposed on residential? So um, what we'll do is a land analysis. So how much, uh, how much developable land is left and you know, what's already developed. And so we actually go parcel by parcel throughout the existing city limits and urban growth area. We'll determine how much land is developed, how much land is undeveloped, and which, how much land has potential for redevelopment. And from that, we'll determine how much land is uh, available to be developed between 2025 and 2045. Um, and then we'll look at our population projections and our uh, economic growth projections and determine how much land we need to accommodate each of those. So first we see where we're at, you know, with our land capacity analysis. And then we say, what is our, pop, our projected population and, uh, and need? And then we put those together and we determine either we can 
expand our urban growth area to accommodate those uh, population and employment growth needs, or we can change our city policies uh, to accommodate it within our current urban growth boundaries. For example, we increase the zoning, uh, the, you know, the amount of land, amount of units allowed in certain residential zones, or change our balance of mixed commercial to, uh, to allow more residential, or I mean, really the door is wide open for what the planning commission and the city feel is best for the city of Cedar Woolley. And that is the comprehensive uh, planning part of what we do. And, you know, instead of, you know, well, we think, you know, at that time we can look at individual pieces and, and see what's going on and where it would best be suited to accommodate each growth. It's, that's a comprehensive look at it. These rezone requests are much, I mean, they're simpler in one way because it's, you're just looking at one piece of land, but it's missing the whole component of what happens down the road with all the rest of the land that you need to accommodate your, your projections. So that's what I say, and you know, I've said many times, if we change from mixed commercial to say R5, what happens is we get our balance out of skew and now we're showing that we're, we're losing mixed commercial land and we don't, we're not proposing to create any more mixed commercial land right now. So, you know, a few years down the road, if the markets change, now we may not, ha may not have the right commercial land available. And that's, that's the concern and that's why this rezone uh, we don't feel is uh, conforms to the comprehensive plan and why staff is recommended to not approve the rezone. Does that answer your question? I believe so. Thank you. So does anybody else have any other questions for staff? I guess that's a, I guess that's a no. So at this particular point, uh, and Mickey, you can help me out with this. It's, I believe I need to uh, ask for a motion to either uh, recommend to uh, city council to rezone or to keep everything as it is, you know, status quo. What, what's, what's your guidance on that? Um, I agree with you. I, I would ask for a motion to either approve or, or deny the request to rezone. Thank you. To recommend approval, sorry, or deny. Yeah. So the floor is open. Would somebody like to recommend an approval or something else? Please speak up someone. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, I make a motion to not approve the recommendation to change the uh, Ruby parcel from mixed commercial to R5. I second. Thank you. Okay, we got a second. We have a, now we have a vote, okay? Vote bef to, uh, to approve uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Johnson's motion or to disapprove. The, to approve, put your hand up, yes or no? Aye. Okay, so we have how many? Because I, I, I can't say. Can, can we have a... I'd recommend a roll call vote in this case. You've got commissioners that are in person and commissioners online. Right, no, totally. So let's go to a roll call. Commissioner Fatizi is a yes to approve Commissioner Johnson's. Commissioner Freiberger? Yes. Commissioner Johnson is a no. Oh. Commissioner Johnson. So, well, it's so, your own motion. No, uh, uh, approve, so, to oh, approve oh, the so, motion okay. to recommend yeah. to deny. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so the motion is to recommend to deny. Right. Correct, yes. Commissioner Pell? Yes. Commissioner Maddox? No. Commissioner Frenette? Yes. Okay, so I think we have a four to one. Five, five to one. Five to one? Including, so that including motion you, you said no yourself, right? You said to recommend yourself, right? I, that, 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 that's correct, yeah. I, I, I agreed with Commissioner Johnson. So staff, so so staff the recognizes motion, the motion of uh, a motion to not rezone the the correct. rezone property has, uh, pass, has passed five to one, which is the result is meaning that uh, the Planning Commission is not recommending approval of the rezone. 
That's correct. But I also want to throw this out there as well. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing the same thing from a, different people about taking a look at our mixed commercial uh, code to begin with. And I think that should be on the, to the table as well. We want people to be successful at the end of the day. So if there's something going on in our code that just isn't working out, let, let, let's have that discussion uh, if we have about five other things we need to, uh, we need to talk about. So I'm, I'm going to move on to the uh, next, go ahead, I'm sorry. John, am I good? Or Nikki, am I good? You're Dad? good. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. And that would be, by the way, hang on, the next rezone matter. Uh, I'm sorry, people. It, it's like... In a kind of different different kind of day for me right now. So we're we're going to move on to the uh, can somebody help me out here? We're so, looking at uh, so right now we're uh, <laughs> moving on to the second public hearing, which is rezone request to number twenty twenty one dash o three eight, which is uh, proposed yeah, yeah, by yeah. Bucko. That that's correct. Yes. Like I said, John, I'm, I'm working on different screens here. It would be the Bucko Rezone. Exactly. RZ 2021-038 Bucko Rezone. So I think the uh, Bucko sisters, they get the uh, first shot at this. So according to our procedures, Joe, that we ahead, I'm, I'm discussed listening. earlier, um, the rules of procedure are, so you just introduced the, the proposal. So Correct, next yes. is a uh, staff presentation, and then uh, following staff presentation, the proponent will Thank have you. their option to uh, their opportunity to speak. And then after that, the chair will open the public hearing, at which time the members of the public get to speak. And then uh, the chair will close the public hearing, and the planning Thank commission you. will have the opportunity to deliberate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway, back. here you go. I'm not sure if this is a point of order point of inquiry or what, but according to the uh, rules of procedures, uh, section code of ethics and decorum rule four, uh, because I have what I believe to be a reasonable conflict of interest with this matter, I'm going to recuse myself and I guess I have to leave the chamber as well. Commissioner Johnson, thank you. You are recused. So Platter Coleman, you, you have the floor. All right. So um, one of the first things I'd like to do is point out that we received a, a couple of items uh, related to this issue. So the applicant submitted a packet to the Planning Commission and that has been provided to the Planning Commission members in the building. It is on their dais and in front of them. Um, and it has been emailed to the, all of the planning commissions. So the planning commission members attending remotely via Zoom right now also have this uh, in front of them on their email. In addition to that, we also received a letter from BYK Construction uh, uh, giving their uh, perspective on this proposal. And that as well has been uh, provided to the planning commission at their dais as well as uh, email to the Planning Commission members, so those attending remotely also have these materials. Um, so I'll give a brief presentation on this proposal. This is the second public hearing that we've had on this uh, proposal, and prior to that, we also had a, a, a regular meeting that wasn't an official public hearing, at which point at which meeting the uh, the applicant also had the opportunity to, to present their uh, information. So uh, this is the third time that this the Planning Commission has had the opportunity to review this. Um, 
Similarly to the previous project, this is a request to change uh, the zoning of a property from mixed commercial. However, this one is a request to change the zoning to residential 15, which is um, the, the high density zoning for uh, the city of Cedar Woolley. It provides for the 15 units per acre in the, in the R15 zone. So it's primarily uh, an apartment zoning. Um, as, uh, as you can see in the memo, uh, this property is located uh, north of Cook Road. Um, it has a 40 foot panhandle uh, to the properties and uh, it goes roughly 300 feet behind the, the properties that front on Cook Road and then this property is uh, behind those. Um, when this property was uh, zoned to mixed commercial, the idea was to provide uh, a larger area of mixed commercial zone to accommodate uh, a larger commercial development, putting this property together with uh, the properties uh, that front Cook Road. Uh, since that time, uh, there's currently a development that would be bringing a road into this property that would also provide access to this commercial land, which uh, staff has presented in the past saying that this uh, opens this property up for more public access and uh, again, good commercial frontage. <coughs> Similarly to the previous project uh, that we just finished discussing, staff has uh, concerns about giving up mixed commercial land uh, without creating mixed commercial land someplace else. Um, I, I believe I've already belabored the point of uh, if we lose our mixed commercial land, uh, how do we accommodate our commercial growth in the future? We've heard, um, you know, some people say, well, you know, there's plenty of mixed commercial land in Cedar Woolley um, that you know, there, there is currently, but not if we give, start uh, turning over mixed commercial land uh, to residential uses. Um, because I have already presented this uh, topic twice and I'm not seeing any new members uh, that haven't been to, to the presentation on this issue, uh, I'm going to forego a, a lengthy discussion uh, that staff presented in our staff report. Um, so I'll just cut to our recommendation and conclusions. Um, there, we're still concerned that losing the mixed commercial land will skew the balance of necessary residential and commercial land within the urban growth area. This will be providing more residential land, uh, several more units than, we, uh, than we've justified in our comprehensive plan and losing commercial land, as I've stated numerous times now, uh, is also frustrating to our comprehensive plan. Uh, I think that's all I have for now. Uh, like to, you know, if there's any any presentations that uh, come up, and if there's questions that you have for staff, um, or if there's anything that you want clarification from, I'll I'll leave it at that. But uh, staff does not recommend approval of uh, the rezone from of the 5.2 acres from mixed commercial to residential 15. John, thank you. And totally appreciate uh, all the work you guys are doing. So we're gonna open up the floor and I believe this is correct, Nikki, right? For the uh, applicant now to uh, have a say and uh, then I'll open up to the public uh, thereafter. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Ms. Bucko, hi. Hi, so um, I'm actually gonna go ahead and go first. Again, if we were there in person, I think Sarah and I would be um, standing up at the podium together, but this is, this is where I we're <laughs> So uh, I am, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and start off. My name is Laura Bucko. Um, 
I live at 41 Pacific Mist, Newport Coast, California. Um, I will go ahead off and, and start off just by saying, you know, I did bring this up last time and I just want to touch on it briefly again. Uh, in our in our almost two years of working on this development project that we are working on, um, aside from this project, we do recognize the hours of you know volunteer work that go into the planning committee and doing things like the comprehensive plan. Um, so in in no way, shape, or form, I do just want to highlight on the fact that we don't think at you know when you guys sat and did this comprehensive plan that that maybe that was the the best decision for this property and some of these parcels at that time. Um, but, you know, things do change. I own a, and, and very quickly, I own a property in Cedar Woolley, uh, a single family home that six months ago, I got a comp on for, you know, 385. And I just did a, a comp on that same house, not even six months later, and it's sitting at 450. So I think that the the problem of affordability is is a very big present issue right now and we've talked about that but um so again i just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to present to you guys i am going to kind of refer to the packet that we sent over um i do want to say that we are coming at this request with a lot of thought and a lot of purpose and, and pure intention in changing this zone we think that it's the highest and the best use for the surrounding properties um, as well as the city of cedar Woolley as a whole the purpose of this goal is to add that much needed affordable housing to Cedar Woolley. And I think one of the only ways to do that, that we're seeing, we're seeing these single family homes that people are purchasing. And then, you know, like I said, six months later to have a 50,000% increase on the value of that home, um, single family homes might not be the way to solve this affordability issue. So that's why we're asking for the R15 zoning, um, because we think that it allows that. Um, it also does provide us a very desirable transition from our single family home development that we have um, to the north and the mixed commercial parcels that border and actually do touch Cook Road. So we do believe that that R15 zone could provide that desirable transition, not just for that single family home, but for those um, commercial properties that will be touching it because, you know, how desirable is it going to be for um, either a local business or say a Starbucks or something like that to come in touching Cook Road, have um, town ho townhomes or garden style apartments, and then a single family development behind it. And if you guys look at the image that we provided, we are showing kind of what that transition would look like where you would have the commercial property, then you have your little bit higher density townhomes or garden style apartments, and then you have your single family and it just flows nicely. Um, one thing I also wanted to bring up was right now how it sits, it is mixed commercial zoning. Um, we can put um, you know, we can put residential there as well. Um, and honestly, the mixed zoning commercial would, uh, or the mixed commercial zoning would be more lucrative to us. We think if any, if we would have sold this property and let any other developer come in, that's probably what they would be utilizing. But this is a legacy project for our grandfather and we did grow up in this community and we want to be proud of this project. And we think that taking the less lucrative project and the thing that's better for the community is the, the route that we want to go. So um, planning has offered in our developers agreement uh, to possibly support us on a UVMU overlay, which would increase the density, again, making it even more profitable for us. And again, that's not the route that we're asking to go. We want to do what's going to be better for the community in this um, scenario. So going to, um, I believe that there was a question on page two on the comments about the 2009 ask of the rezone of the previous owner. I just mainly want to point out the fact that we weren't the previous owner. So um, I don't, even though the previous owner does have the same last name as us, um, we aren't the previous owner. And so I, we just don't really see the relevance in that specific comment. Um, moving on to the next comment, um, talking about the area of that mixed commercial area not being very deep, if you were to take away this mixed commercial designation behind it, um, we do own that 
parcel behind it that we're asking for the rezone on. And without um, that parcel ever being sold to another developer to create this larger um, commercial space that is desired there, possibly by the planning committee, um, I don't think that that could ever happen unless we sold our property. In, in knowing what we have going on um, with our single family <laughs> development, we probably are never going to want to put commercial space up against our single family um, homes. Again, for purpose of the community and the people who are gonna be living alongside that. Um, I believe Paul in the last meeting touched on the fact that he's never had a, a buyer say that they wish that they had a grocery store in their backyard. So. We did look at, um, you know, with with actual developers, uh, what this would look like to have a commercial space in the area that's already there, saying that 300 feet is not a good enough, enough depth. We've uh, kind of penciled out actually how this would look um, with parking and landscape. And it looks like we could have a really, really nice little strip mall there. Um, you know, maybe it's not the big box that you were looking for, but I could see a lot of really great, uh, more local businesses being able to utilize this area here. And I believe somebody else on the last meeting also touched on the fact that um, <clears throat> we, a lot of people don't want to see necessarily a huge big box going in on Cook Road. Maybe we can keep that to I-5, maybe Highway 20, um, and, and, and keep Cook Road in this transitional area um, you know, a little, a little more like this, uh, as we displayed in the picture. Um, the next comment that I wanted to address was here again, where it's just talking about um, the arterial road. Again, I want to point out that when we submitted this rezone request, um, the arterial road was never part of that plan. Um, we worked really hard with the city of Sijuwuli to get our project approved and to also um, help facilitate this arterial road that's really going to help with the traffic issue in Sijuwuli. So while this is going to bring some um, frontage to that parcel, again, it's just not going to be the desirable place for um, you know, a commercial property. I think that um, Rob Janicki even touched on, this is actually going into the next comment, so I apologize. Next comment is talking, you know, I think it's been kind of the repeated thing for this whole meeting. Taking away mixed commercial means um, you have to allocate it somewhere else. Uh, I do understand what you guys are talking about. You guys have to look at the bigger picture and you need to make sure that there's going to be that commercial space there. Um, I personally think that the, the people have to be able to come first before you're going to want to have, a, you know, big box or, or more commercial space. Um, COVID also changed a lot of things and people do a lot of different stuff online now. So, um, you know, I do think supporting our local businesses and, um, and some, you know, things like Starbucks and things like that coming to Sijuoli are super awesome. But we had Rob Janicki on the last um, on the last meeting here, and he openly stated that he is the largest owner of mixed commercial and co commercial property in the city of Sijuwuli, and that it's been sitting vacant for 21 years. So, I think that we can look at some feedback from not just a community member but an active developer in our community and be like, okay, so let's address the issue here being that there's a housing shortage. So all these people that wanna live in Cedar Woolley can't. And so those people are gonna go find other places to live and are not gonna be supporting our commercial and economic growth in Cedar Woolley. So I think changing something like this to R15, allowing people to come in and have that entry level pricing that we've been talking about City of Sijuwuli's median age is 33 years old, with 50% of the population being from the ages of 19 to 35. That's your first time buyers, and they can't afford to buy a house that was built in 1970, like my home, that's $450,000 and, and needs some work. So we're trying to solve that, invite people into our community, then grow the commercial space, which I think when we need it, we can probably call Rob Janicki and get some of it from him. Um, that kind of concludes my part. Um, 
on this, you know, we do talk about the R15, um, you know, that there already is a lot in Cedra Woolley. We did dive a little deeper into that. And while there is designated R15s in Cedra Woolley, there is um, not a lot that's actually develop, uh, developable. So um, as you can see in the exhibit, I don't, just for time's sake, I probably don't need to go through each individual one, um, but each of them have, you know, an acre here, an acre here, um, have been halfway developed and maybe have a little section that's not developed. So really the, the area where R15 could actually be developed, where townhomes and garden style apartments could actually be put in is extremely limited. So while I understand that we need the mixed commercial, um, I think we have it. We need <laughs> entry level housing. We don't have it. And that's really what we're trying to do here. It's not the lucrative move. It's simply the problem at hand and finding the solution for that. And then I think Sarah's gonna finish off over here for you guys. Um, yeah, hi guys. Thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity to um, just kind of present and, um, and just talk um, regarding these comments. Um, I won't go through each one of these um, exhibits either. You have them in front of you. You can kind of just see here, you know, these are all of the, um, existing R15 zone land that we have in the city of Cedra Woolley. Um, you can see when you're going through the exhibits that most of them are fully developed. Um, and so this is really, um, if you go through each one, this is really the supply of multifamily housing that we have um, in Cedra Woolley. And, you know, it's really, it's really not a lot. Um, and As noted above, you know, kind of removing this, you know, 5.2 acres of land um, is is only removing 1.9% of the currently zoned mixed commercial land that we have available in the city. Um, so, you know, there's a definitely a lot of existing commercial space available um, for, for lease in the city of Cedar Woolley and, you know, waiting to be built. Um, you, down the road, you guys know that um, right next to this parcel is there's two big UVMU projects going in, being built. Um, and that's over 20,000 square feet of new commercial, you know, retail space. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot coming in really, really close to this parcel. Um, and, you know, we really believe that that is going to provide the community with all of the, you know, commercial space that, you know, they need. And, you know, I hope that they will, it will all get filled. I, I think that I'm definitely hearing a lot um, from the planning commission and, and, and staff about a concern of the commercial space. You know, if we take away this parcel of mixed commercial, then oh, what are we going to do with it? Where are we going to put it? There's nowhere to put it. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of emphasis going into this concern about commercial space. And it's a little bit hard to hear because we are in the middle of a huge housing crisis. Um, you know, Skagit County has been number one in the state of Washington for lack of vacancies, we're at 0.2% vacancies for rental units. Um, and we've been number one for the past three years, um, according to the University of Washington Center for Research, uh, Real Estate Research. So, you know, not only are we 0% number one in the state for vacancies for, for rental housing, um, you know, there's an extreme affordability issue According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, two out of five households in Skagit County couldn't afford the home that they occupied. Um, you know, in 2019, our, the, the census showed that the median household income in Cedar Woolley was $60,000. So, you know, that would mean that an affordable mortgage or rent payment would be 
$1,500 a month. And I think that we all know what rents are going for. Um, you know, in August, the median home price in Cedarly was 500000 That's a mortgage payment for a lot more than 1500 a month. So we're suffering this huge housing crisis. And I feel like we're prior prioritizing commercial space over housing. And not just any housing. We know that there's single family homes going in. We know that, you know, the project that we have proposed is, you know, six to 9,000 square foot lots. These are larger homes, but we really haven't allowed this type of housing where it's the multifamily home housing. Um, so it's a different product than, than what is going in via the UVMUs. You know, they're smaller apartments above retail space. Um, we're really hoping to provide more of a courtyard style walk-up apartment or townhome um, where, you know, people can still have a little bit of a yard, but we're going to bring the prices down. Um, so um, moving on, the current R15 zones and how they're developed and the lack of developable proper, property that's that's vacant in the R15 zones, um, you know, 78 units would really be crucial. That's kind of what we could, we've calculated that we could put in if we get the R15 zone, 78 units. Um, we really, doing the mixed commercial, we could, you know, we could hit that mark as well. Um, we could get this, you know, same amount of units and we could probably get a little bit more because um, we're talking about eight units per building, you know, getting roughly two buildings per acre would be 16 units per acre. So that would be around 83 units for the full 5.21 acres. So I think that, you know, it's, we really just want to hit that this is not going to bring changing the zoning to R15 doesn't necessarily make it so that we're bringing more popular, uh, you know, we're not increasing the population um, from what we would be with the, with the mixed commercial zoning. We could still kind of hit that density that we're talking about. Um, it's just, we're talking about a different, a different product. Um, and I know last time, or maybe it was at the, uh, on our first meeting where we kind of talked about, I, I use the term middle housing a lot. And, um, you know, that I, I kept getting asked, you know, what is middle housing? What, what does that mean? Middle housing? What are you talking about? And really middle housing is just a range of house scale buildings with multiple units that kind of bridge the gap between the single family homes that we have and then the more intense, higher density multifamily, like what we see um, in the UVMU and and via, you know, apartments above commercial space. Um, we've, we're so happy that those are going in, the UVMUs, and we think that they're definitely needed, but we're missing this whole um range of housing, housing supply. And that's, and that's the middle housing. Um, and I know I said this last time as well, but you know, that there's just a flurry of growth management act bills going through the Senate right now to try to get more housing in via these um, mandatory zoning changes, allowing for this type of housing. Um, mandatory middle housing was actually on the agenda and they, it got watered down to an incentive program first, giving money um, to municipalities via grants that implement these zones and attempt to give the cities the right thing to do before they come in. Um, and you know, they didn't want to make it mandatory. They, they, they said, let's, you know, let's give them incentives to kind of do the right thing. And I, and I think, I, I think that local cities will understand uh, what a housing crisis we're in and how these specific types of middle housing are, are really necessary. Um, and then, you know, it, if it, we'll see, you know, a lot more got added to the, to, to the docket this year. 
I just think it's really important to note that this housing crisis existed before the pandemic, um, but the pandemic has definitely made it far more acute um, and kind of impossible to ignore. So I really just think that now's the time to really let our actions reflect the urgency of this crisis. We, you know, we we don't have a we don't have a commercial retail space crisis. We really have a housing crisis and I just the magnitude of our shortage requires more action. Um so that's, you know, what I have. Thank you so much for hearing us out and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about um uh, about our presentation. Thank you. Uh so we're going to open this up to the uh, public if we're if we're done. And uh, like I said, I'm I'm not uh, in town hall right now. John, do we have anybody uh, in the audience, or do we have anybody uh, online that would like to uh, have a say on this? Do you want to speak? Talk to me. There's. There, there's, there's, there's no, there's nobody in the audience here that's uh, here to speak on this issue. Okay. Do we have anybody else online that would like to uh, opine on on this uh, proposal? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, BYK Construction, seven hundred two Metcalf Street. Um, thanks, Laura and Sarah. Uh, we, Paul and I, are actually working with Laura and Sarah kind of helping them out. Um, we are um, hoping to be involved in, in their single family project. Um, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I support the rezone here. I, you know, we, as developers, you know, we've talked a lot about the mixed commercial zoning and how hard it is to develop in and, you know, if this piece doesn't get rezoned, it's it's going to sit for however many years it sits for until either the zoning gets ch um, changed or the the code for the mixed commercial gets changed. Um, I want to speak a little bit about transitional zoning. Um, Laura touched on it a little bit, but I think it's crucial to have a good transition from from single family uh, homes to uh, commercial. And I think the R15 with, um, like Sarah said, a different product than kind of the high rise um, apartments, more of a, a family apartment environment for, um, you know, entry level families and, and people that don't want to be in the, in the high rise, but can't afford a, a single family house. Um, Basically, you know, in, in closing, it, it's in my comments closing, you know, what's what's more important to the Planning Commission? Is it, is it holding on to commercial real estate that's not going to get developed or is it addressing, you know, a housing crisis that we're in? And I hope you guys all took time to read through the presentation. Um, I feel like Laura and Sarah wanted to try to be mindful of your time and and tried to kind of hit on the points and there is a lot of information in that presentation that that I think is important and actual data that we you know actually researched on so um, I support the rezone and with that I will turn it back over to you thank you Tim uh, do we have anyone else either online or in person that would like to comment before I turn this over to the, uh, the planning commission. I'll take that as a no. So anyway, uh, the floor is open for uh, everyone. Uh, like I said, I can't see anybody. So uh, feel free to uh, jump in. So this is John. I'm really sorry. I did just want to ask, by the way, too, because normally it does say that the meeting is recording. Is this one not recording today? I'm sorry. It's it's being recorded. Okay, I was just curious. Sorry. Yeah.
Do you have anything else to say? Or are we good? <laughs> right, Bill, it's being recorded. Okay. okay. I was just asking. Okay, no worries. Uh, so correct. somebody jump on in. Joe Frenette, since I'm staring at you on the screen, why don't you uh, hop in first? So this, this is John real quick. I want to point out that it is uh, 822 and we're closing the public hearing portion. Okay. Uh, we are closing the public hearing portion at 822. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> got it. You got to back me up. Anyway, so on to the Planning Commission. Commissioner Frenette, how about we start with you? Any comments? You're, you're on mute, Joe. We, can, we, can't, we can't hear you. Wonder how that happened. Sorry. There you go. There, there you go. Uh, it's all good. All right. What I was saying was I'll make it simple. Um, great presentation. And in this particular case, I think it's warranted to make the change in this particular area. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Commissioner Maddox? Um, I, I'm... Uh, I'll go on record saying I'm in favor of this rezone uh, request. I believe the zoning makes sense in the location where it's at. I am, as you all know, highly sympathetic to the need for additional housing um, within the urban growth area and um, skeptical that uh, our comprehensive plan projections from 20 years ago are still relevant in uh, regards to the need for maintaining non-viable mixed commercial zoning. So um, anyway, I, I'm in favor of this. No further comments. So, so I want to throw this out there. I mean, we're putting in all this density with people like housing. And this is not R15. Listen, there's better zones than R15, in my opinion, for what you're trying to uh, accomplish here. So why R15? I mean, the R5, R7s, at, at five acres, you could PDR it, but you could do what, what you're looking to do. So my confusion is putting in that kind of density in an already dense kind of place. I mean, our, our R15 is literally right next door, and I don't believe you're correct on 20,000 square feet in the uh, UVMU. And John did 20,000, that, that, that's a whole lot of space. And I don't think Between we're the two of them? But I'm asking uh, Tyler Coleman. Our UVMU, we have two projects, right? Now. And I heard 20,000 square feet of commercial space? I don't believe that's correct. Um, I do not have those project files in front of me, and I do not recall the specific statistics for for that. Um, so I that, I, I, I can't comment on that. I know what twenty thousand square feet looks like, and uh, looking at both of those footprints, I don't think we we have. That. So, so anyway, you know, so you know, uh, we, we do have the ability while we're discussing. Since Tim's still here, he actually is. Uh, doing one of those projects so he can probably tell us specifically how much commercial space is uh, if he's still there. Tim, have at it. We're all ears. Yeah, Tim Woodman, C, BYK Construction. Um, yeah, so our our building is not actually under construction yet. We are, um, we've been through the SEPA process and have uh, submitted uh, for permit and actually received comments back and, and resubmitted for permits. And our building is, um, the ground floor consists of a, of 10,500 square feet of new commercial storefront space. And also consists of around, somewhere in the mid twenties of- uh, On the residential uh, ground, ground level parking. Um, on the first floor. And then there's uh, three levels of uh, apartments above that um, that consists of 67 total residential units above it. And I think Janik, the Janicki project was around 12,000. So 12,000 plus 10,500 is over 20,000 square feet of commercial space. 
it stands to reason that it's somewhere in the ballpark of 20,000. Yeah, I, I, would not, I would not dispute that. So the, the, the issue at, at hand here is going to, an, it's our highest density zone for apartments. So I'm, what I'm saying is I think there's other options here to accomplish what you're looking to do. So anyway, uh, Commissioner Penno, I'm just going around the table here because again, I can't see anybody. Yes, Joe, thanks. Um, I want to thank you, you guys for your presentation. It was really well thought out and uh, I enjoyed listening to it. Um, I'm thank all you. for affordable housing. I always have been. Um, what worries me is it actually being affordable I mean, some people say affordable. What is affordable? So I, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, affordable rent, I think you're going to have a bigger issue with than being able to sell a house to someone. So all of these apartments, I'm not thrilled with. Um, the density bothers me. We've got how many school? we'll need more schooling, and, and we'll need some more of that mixed commercial space to put the little sandwich shops and coffee stands and nail salons these people need to go to in. Um, I really do enjoy your proposal and, and, and I, you've really well thought it out and I appreciate what you've brought to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Freiberger. Well, um, first I wanna say thank you for your presentation. Um, and thanks for addressing the middle housing um, question in more detail um, from the previous uh, meeting uh, that was um, informative. Um, I do share staff's concern with um, the percentages of the mixed commercial and where else are we going to put that? I know that can be revisited. Um, uh, but that is something that I don't think can be done quickly and easily. So um, that's kind of where I'm approaching this from. And that's all I had. You know, I get everybody's concern and uh, where different people want different directions to go. So uh, I believe that uh, we don't have to make that decision tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. It sounds like this is something that uh, should be on the table to discuss more. It's getting late. And how many uh, acres? I, Tim, are you still here? Tim? Yeah, I'm how still many, here. How many acres are we talking about right next door at that? I think it's an R7 or R5 zone right next door. We're looking at like 70 acres or something like that. What, 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 what's the other parcels? Uh, sorry, you guys would know. Are you, so, yeah, uh, no, you can direct those kind no. of questions to staff. This is That's not Tim's project. So what is okay, your no, question sorry, specifically? Thanks. So how many acres do we have on, on the side of that? On the, on the side of what? Right right next to this uh, this five acres. I believe they have a proposal in for like 70 plus single family houses. Or, am I off? Or? Yeah, well, uh, I think Sarah or Laura can address that succinctly. Okay, so They're we're right. looking at 70 plus houses in one place and now an R15 to do a higher density, you know, I, yeah. I think we need to talk about it a little bit more because because yeah. here's the thing. Hang on a second. We do. Yeah. Oh, you Did you ask I'm about how many minutes? Please let me speak. Okay. Oh, sorry. I thought you asked a question about how many, how, how many units we were. I, I think John already answered that. So, but he did say that and I apologize. So we're, we're looking for, 70 plus houses on top of now our highest density of apartments. Okay, this isn't, this isn't, uh, the proposal here isn't for single family housing. The proposal here is for more apartments on top of more apartments that are literally right across the, 
the street. So, so that's my concern. And, and Commissioner Penno said this uh, earlier. So, how are you going to provide services for all these people when we put in all this high density? And, th and that's my concern. Okay, and that's just me. Okay, there's a whole bunch of different people here that have a say as well. So, can uh, I can I comment on that? Can I, can I just, can I, you said something, you said that we are going to be putting in apartments and it's the highest density um, apartments that are allowed in the city of Cedar Hill. And I just want to correct that. This, yeah. um, the multifamily zone, it does not say that we have to put in apartments. We, we can put in townhomes. Um, we can put in, you know, we can put in townhomes. We don't, we don't have to put in apartments. We can put in townhomes. But, but here on the rezone, you could also sell that property to somebody else. So we're we're looking at a bigger picture here, okay? Yeah. This this is and, not and it's, and it's also doing. not the highest. I'm not, done. I'm not done, and we've been burned on this before, where you get a certain type kind of thing going in, and all of a sudden somebody does something a little bit different. So when you're doing rezones, okay, it's it's just a bigger picture from what the city's perspective is, and when people are telling me that. Oh well, gee, you know, commercial doesn't matter today. Well, I'll tell you right now, two years from now it might. And as a commercial real estate broker, I kind of know this stuff. Okay, so what's happening today doesn't necessarily gonna it's it's not gonna mean what it might be five years from now. So anyway, unless someone uh, has a, a proposal right now to make a motion to uh Silas, did you want to speak? Did you have something city? you wanted to say? I'm sorry? I think Silas had something he wanted to say. <laughs> hmm. um, well, I this just wanted to say that I, part of this proposal, as I understand it, is to provide some transitional zoning here between the R7 and the mixed commercial so that you don't end up with a situation where... Uh, you have a large mixed commercial development backing up uh, directly to an R7 zone. And, um, and in that context, I think the high zoning uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the R15 zone makes a lot of sense in this area. Um, and I also want to just comment that uh, within the city and the urban growth area, we are best positioned to provide the additional service for the services that are necessary for uh, population to accommodate greater population growth. Um, this growth is going to happen in this region regardless of whether we get ahead of it or not. And uh, nobody, well, there might be some people, but the general consensus in this in Skagit County is that we want to preserve farmland and we want to keep the you know, wild space is wild. And if we don't make substantive moves to accommodate increased growth within Cedro Woolley and within the other municipalities around here, that development is going to go out into the farmland, whether we like it or not. And so um, we have, you know, municipal services available here and the infrastructure with which to accommodate growth and, uh, having higher density uh, reduces unit costs. That's just how it goes. Economics is supply and demand. If you can increase the supply, the prices are gonna go down. And so, and from a development perspective, if you can put 15 units per acre, the unit cost is gonna be substantially lower than if you can put seven units per acre or five units per acre. And so, um, Commissioner Penno's comment about affordability is well taken, but affordability is not really the right way to talk about it because uh, what's affordable to one person is not affordable to another. Exactly. You know, it's very subjective, but um, the reality is, is that uh, higher density uh, development is uh, less costly per unit. And um, that's ultimately what it comes down to. And uh, we need more options for uh, different levels and styles of housing um, 
within the city here. So that's it for now. So point well taken. But the great thing is we don't get to make that call, right? It's the mayor and council that gets to make All that right. call. I, so I think I'd be ready to vote like to tonight. Would you be ready to vote, Danielle? Yes. I don't think we need to extend this any longer, Joe. I'm going to make a motion to recommend that the count, that we deny the rezone. Okay. Do we have a, a second to that? I will second that. Okay. So we have a second to deny the rezone. Uh, will we take a vote now in favor of denying the rezone? Raise your hand. Can we do a roll call vote so we can see, so we can hear? We can. John, again, I'm, I'm out of my box here because I'm working off of a screen. Commissioner Freiberger, deny yes or no? Yay. So that's a yes to deny. Yes. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Fatizi, that's a yes. Commissioner Penno? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Maddox? No. Okay. We got one no. Commissioner Frenette? No. So that's two no's, and I think we have four yeses. Is that correct? It's three. Three to two. Yep. Three to two. We have a planning commissioner who uh, recused himself. Okay. So we're not going to pass it up the uh, chain, but it doesn't mean that uh, this is uh, a dead action, but we're just not going to take any action on it right so, now. So the next step is, the next step is uh, I will... The staff will create a staff report, uh, will create a findings of fact and recommendation, uh, including the procedural history and the discussion topics and uh, the vote count, uh, which is uh, three, uh, three votes to deny the rezone request and two, vote, two votes to approve. So uh, the planning commission three to two has recommended to deny that, uh, recommended that the city council deny the rezone request. And so that will be forwarded to the city council for their review at a future city council meeting. Okay, thank you. So as I go down the uh, agenda items here, we have uh, planning commission discussion items. We have nothing. And uh, I would like to adjourn the meeting right now. At, uh, well, I would like a motion to adjourn. I'll motion make the motion adjourn. we adjourn. Do I have a second? <clears throat> Second, I'll second. second that. Second, we got a second to the motion to adjourn. The meeting is adjourned at 8.40 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to yeah, make sure that and somebody else was ready to go. Can I ask you a personal question? Was